Because if I was the Michael Jackson and Joe Jackson raised his voice at me, I'd be like, don't talk to me like that in Barry Gordy house. Don't make me call the pappy and tell him that you acting a ninja around here, Joe. <laughs> She didn't want her son to be corrupted by Diana or her show business circle of friends. Also, she knew very little about Diana. She knew her as a star with a reputation for being egotistical and self-involved. Okay. I mean, she is an Aries. The whole time Michael was away from her, Katie could only imagine what was going on in the Ross household. Nothing. Not a damn thing. Nothing. Nothing. One thing her children will say about her is that before she was a performer, she's a mother. Now, she don't have kids right now, but this girl don't do nothing. Nathan. I mean, she might have some catty ways about her, but as far as having wild sex drug parties in a house, negative. Do we see her in pictures at Club 55 shaking it? Yes, but we ain't never heard nothing about that lady going in nobody's room fucking around with the booger sugar. Okay, Katie, you lunching, but you know, Katie might be a little hater right now. The whole time Michael was away from her, Katie could only imagine what was going on in the Ross household and how Michael was coping with it. Her imagination ran wild. It was a time of great concern, wondering what kinds of values Diana Ross was passing on to her son. How to make it in the business. How to put yourself first. Perhaps making matters more difficult for Catherine. Diana seemed reluctant to talk to her directly. When Catherine would telephone to check in on Michael, she would have to talk to one of the household staff if Diana would not come to the phone. If Catherine was distressed about the possibility of wild parties at the Diana Ross residence, she need not have been. Diana was a serious person, not a party girl. She would go to bed early in order to be up on time for her many appointments. Y'all, no busnet. And now that I'm working, I be in the bed by about 8, 8.30 every night. I don't pay about my sleep. She would go to bed early in order to be up on time for her many appointments. If anything, she passed on to Michael a work ethic that would serve him well as a youngster. She wanted to be an example to him, and she was sure to not allow him to see anything but her best side. I can believe that. I got to know her well. Michael would say many years later, and she taught me so much by example. I remember she would be in the recording studio until all hours of the morning, get home, have a costume fitting, a rehearsal, lunch, a TV show, and then she would crash for maybe two hours, then back in the studio. I remember thinking, I don't have it bad at all. Look at her. And she's Diana Ross. With I Want You Back, Barry Gordy, Deke Richards, Fonz Mazel, and Freddie Perrin managed to launch Motown's latest find with a blast and the record label into a new exciting decade. Remember, uh, basically the Jackson 5 saved Motown. A precocious yet completely adorable and endearing, Michael led his older brothers into the hearts, homes, and stereos of middle-class white America. The Roosing single also found success on the black or rhythm and blues charts. As with the successful Supremes formula of the 60s, the Jackson 5 sound presented a wholesome, non-threatening soul for music easily digested and readily accepted by all races of record buyers. Not since Sammy Davis Jr. had the world seen a child performer with as innate a command of himself on stage as Michael Jackson. Both as a singer and dancer, young Michael exuded a presence that was simply uncanny. After this youngster was heard recording Smokey Robinson's 
plaintive, bluesy, who's loving you? The question among Motown's staffers was, where did he learn that kind of emotion? The answer is that he didn't have to learn it. It just seemed to be there for him. Producers were always astonished at how Michael would in between recording sessions play games that preteen children enjoy, such as cards and hide and seek, and then step behind a microphone and belt out a song with the emotional agility and presence of an old soul who's seen his share of heartache. Equally amazing was the fact that aside from listening to demonstration tapes of the songs sung by a session singer to give him direction on the lead melody and Deke Richards' constant prodding to clean up his diction, Michael was pretty much left to his own devices in the studio. When he was told to sound like a rejected suitor, no one in the studio actually expected him to do it. From legendary soul singer Jackie Wilson, Michael mastered the importance of onstage drama. He learned early on that dropping dramatically to one knee, an old Wilson tactic, usually made an audience whoop and holler. However, for the most part, watching young Michael at work was like observing an honor student of James Brown. 101. At the beginning of November 1969, Barry Gordy leased a house for the Jackson family at 1601 Queens Road in Los Angeles. Hold the hell on. So Joe Jackson ain't the pappy. Barry the Gordy is the man of the house. Bullshit the baker. I don't know. I'm shocked that Joseph allowed that. Because he seems like the type of man that want to be like, this is my house. You do what I say do. You can't do that, Joseph. Not when Barry the Gordy paying the bills. Because if I was the Michael Jackson and Joe Jackson raised his voice at me, I'd be like, don't talk to me like that in Barry Gordy house. Don't make me call the pappy and tell him that you acting a ninja around here, Joseph. Michael moved out of Diana Ross's home and in with his father and brothers. A month later, Catherine, Latoya, Janet, and Randy joined the rest of the family. Motown paid for their flights, their first plane ride. Now, let me pause on this. It's things that's in this book that the movie American Dream strategically did not mention to us. Like the contract, okay? Cause they smoothed that contract in the movie American Dream, The Jackson Family. They made it seem like Bird Gordy, Billy D, saved them mothers from the poverty. I mean, they did, but then they didn't. So, I mean, they were in a small house, but they were still homeowners. Like They didn't say anything in the movie that uh, Barry Gordy was like, here, here's your house. They didn't say that. Just the Jacksons just ended up in the house. Oh, Joseph, the house is so pretty, Joseph. As they arrived at the house, the boys were waiting on the front lawn. Michael was the first to throw himself into his mother's arms. But you got so big, she exclaimed. Tears streamed down her face as she hugged each of her boys in turn. Jackie, ever the tease, lifted Marlon up and tossed him in the air. Me next, me next, three-year-old Janet squealed. Catherine would recall that once inside the house, she took a long look around the living room. It was large, twice the size of the entire house in Gary. It ain't Gary. That's for sure, Joseph told her with a proud smile. What you so proud for? That ain't your house. That's Barry the Gordy's house. Catherine closed her eyes. He led his wife out to the backyard patio. Okay, you can open them now, he told her. A panorama of dust time, Los Angeles, lay stretched below the hillside home. Thousands of lights twinkling like earthbound stars. A dark blue sky above, clear and cloudless, was full of stars. This must be what heaven looks like, Catherine said, when she could speak. I've never seen anything so beautiful. 
Well, Barry Gordy did pay for well, it. Well, it's here for you every night, Joseph told her, like his ass bought it. Earl, he was happy to see her, his wife and partner. Sometimes Catherine's sadness was so acute, it bordered on depression. Joseph knew he was responsible. He tried not to think about what he was doing to her, focusing instead on what he was doing for her, such as being able to present her with such a new and exciting lifestyle. Hold on, you ain't the pappy. Though Joseph had his dalliances, he had always insisted that Katherine Jackson was the woman he had ever truly loved and the rest were dot, 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 diversions. I believe that. I believe that's how Leo's are. That's what they do. I remember when uh, the Texan made his last effort to try to get me to stay with him. He told me flat out, he said, nay, why was you even thinking that I really fucked with them girls? Do you know they was just there? Do you understand that? That they was just there? And I applaud his um, truthfulness about it. But see, it was always that one girl that was there. You see what I'm saying? If it was like thousands of girls, not thousands, I mean, the nigga would never sleep or eat or work. But if it was like a dozen girls there or maybe three or four girls there, three or what? four girls constantly changed, but that one never left. So it got to the point that I didn't know whether I was the girl, the main girl, the girlfriend, the partner, the whatever, or not. I started thinking that I was the side chick. You, I didn't put too much work in with you for me to figure out whether I'm the chick or a chick. Joseph could be cruel and unconsciousable. At times, he could be selfish. Over the years, he would watch as Catherine's love for him foundered on the rocks of his blatant infidelity and dogged ambition. However, when he was alone with her, what they shared in those quiet moments was real and powerful, and it lasts to this day. They have been married for 53 years. Catherine recalled that she asked to be alone for a moment in the outdoors of her new home. There she stood among the orange trees and flower beds, all illuminated in a spectacular way. Joseph had turned on the outdoor sound system so that romantic music could be heard playing softly in the background. The air smelled of jasmine. It was magical. Catherine whirled around at the sound of the woman's unfamiliar voice. But before either of them could say anything, Michael was at Catherine's side. Mama, this is her. This is Diana Ross. He said, isn't she beautiful? Isn't she just beautiful? Later, telling a friend about the incident, Catherine would remember that Diana was as slim, young, and attractive as she appeared on the television screen. Catherine, who was short and rounded, became painfully aware of how plain she herself may have looked to the glamorous singer. She walked towards her with a limp. Diana glided as if on air. She was warm and friendly, her large, dark eyes dancing. She took Catherine's hand. Mrs. Jackson, I am so happy to meet you, she said. Your kids have talked about you so much. They are just the best. As pleased as she was to hear her children praised, Catherine could not help wondering why Diana was, was at the house. Because that's Barry Gordy's house. As pleased as she was to hear her children praised, Catherine could not help wondering why Diana was at the house. And when she had arrived, Diana must have sensed her unspoken questions. Oh, I was just visiting, she said by way of explanation. She hugged Catherine warmly and kissed her on the cheek. Catherine told Diana that she was grateful for all she had done for her boys, especially Michael, and that she was happy to be able to raise him herself. 
Ooh, that Catherine. Ooh, you know Latoya said that don't be fooled by the demeanor. She a piece of work. And then Catherine, why are you so jealous for? You know Diana Ross want her own damn kids with the Barry Gordy. Why the hell you? She don't want your baby. Girl. But then that's all Catherine has is being a mother. She's a mother and wife. Okay, and she can't have no Diana Ross coming along trying to take care of one of her babies. Catherine okay. told Diana that she was grateful for all she had done for her boys, especially Michael, and that she was happy to be able now to raise him herself. He needs his mother, she said firmly. I have been gone too long, she added. At that, Diana seemed to become uncomfortable. Her attitude changed. I don't know why. I wouldn't be uncomfortable. Not in my nigga house, I wouldn't be uncomfortable. I'm happy for you, she said softly. She seemed crestfallen by the subtle reminder that she might no longer be as influential in young Michael's life. She loved being his mother, even for just such a short time. She would miss it. Her life had been lonely, one devoted to career pursuits since she was about 15. However, it wouldn't be long before she would have children of her own, three girls and then later two boys, and devote as much of herself to them as she would to her career. I'd love to chat, she told Catherine, but I can't because I'm very busy. That's right. And the man who owns your house. You at least stay for a cup of coffee, Catherine offered. No, not really. I must run now. I'm sure you understand. Oh, sure, Catherine said. Without another word, Diana turned and walked into the night. Bye, Michael called out after her, but Diana didn't answer. Catherine hugged Michael. Then without a backward glance at the breathtaking view, mother and son walked hand in hand into the house to begin their new life. And Bird Gordy's high. <laughs>